welcome everyone online, or if you're watching this recording later, I welcome you to Unity of Chautauqua in our Wednesday evening class. Tonight, we're going to be speaking on the subject of day and night experience. That may sound odd, but hopefully after an hour, we're going to get a little sense for the difference between our activity during the day, even if we're just sitting reading, and our activity at night when we're sleeping, and how important that nighttime of sleep is. Most of us in this room, I know some of you, um, are active, creative doers in life. You do lots of activity and so forth, and so sleep, when you lie there in bed, you're not taking in anything through your physical senses, or may seem kind of like a nothing time. But hopefully, if you have that idea at all, by the end of our hour together, you'll have a deeper appreciation and respect for the process of sleep and what may be going on in that process. I am not going to be conveying any particular teachings to you that you must believe this or that. I'm going to only give some indications, some ideas that you might consider and use your common sense to determine, hey, I think I want to practice this, or I think I want to read more about this. Something intrigues me that sleep, nighttime, may be a much richer, important experience than perhaps I thought of before. If you all leave with just a greater curiosity, I'll feel like I have done something with this class. I want to begin, and for those of you that are online, if you're familiar with um, Chautauqua Assembly, where you can see the lectures recorded from Chautauqua, um, consider looking at yesterday, August 2nd, the main lecture is by author Siddhartha Riadero. I'm pronouncing that somewhat correctly. Uh, he's an amazing man from Brazil, and he's done a great deal of research into sleep. And he presented a wonderful lecture where he took us through the history of sleep. I can't go into that tonight, just suffice it to say that many cultures throughout time have held sleep in high regard, that part of the sleep process is dreaming, and they considered dreams an opportunity for higher powers, God, the spiritual world, however you want to name it, to guide us, to help us resolve problems, to even physically heal us. And although he said we live in a culture now where if the CEO at your work came in and told the board, I had a dream, we must do such and such. He might not have his or her job very long <laughs> because our culture does not consider dreams to be much more than nighttime fantasy, like we speak of daydreaming. It's kind of fun to do daydreaming and doodling but do you know many people that consider daydreaming a really creative, worthwhile activity? That it's valuable, that it has meaning. The same with night dreaming. It was once considered a very important part of life. Perhaps in his work, he can help encourage people to respect this process of sleeping, dreaming that comes with it. He gave us a few short suggestions I'll bring up later because they're the same ideas that I'm hoping to present in my handout materials for you to consider. Enhancing your dreams, 
He said requires two, requires three steps. And I'll go ahead and mention them now since I brought them up. One is preparing for sleep. Well, he suggested, and he likes to use a lot of scientific research studies, which is not quite the approach I take in my unity teachings. But he said preparing for sleep. He didn't say you can't do such and such, but he said, for example, in the evening and the hours leading up to your sleep, if you do drink alcohol, it will affect the dreaming process. If you look at your phone and your computer and any other devices, even television, that produce especially the blue lights, but even TV, it will affect your dreaming process. It may even take over the dreaming process. I remembered all my life, my mother taught me some good things, but one thing I remembered when I was a teenager, it was a custom among several of my classmates to listen to a particular radio program of popular music, listen to it in the evening, and leave the radio on and go to sleep listening to that, and it played all night until we woke up in the morning. Now, I'll always remember my mother, after a while, she said goodnight to me and she said, Bill, why don't you consider turning the radio off before you go to sleep? Because don't you want to have your own creative ideas and your dreams rather than what the man on the radio was telling you all night? And our scientists, far more skilled in that area than I, brought up that same point. And I do have a habit of watching entertaining programs up to that time, which I'm convinced I'm going to change. I already, by common sense, have come to the conclusion, what do I want to carry into my sleep? And from television, do I want to carry the news at 10 o'clock into my dreams? I don't know about it here, but I know in Minneapolis, St. Paul, it's usually half the program is about the latest shootings, disasters, many negative things that I don't particularly want to dream about. So part of this process of believing or building up respect for your sleep and so he suggested this step one preparing for it two I just mentioned Siddhartha said plan an intention take an intention a focused willful choice of what you want to take into sleep now for some that can be even a question. I was riding up here on the Turner bus, and the man said, well, what are you teaching? And I just mentioned a couple of things. Oh, yes, sleep is so important. Do you know that if you practice something like music all day and then you rest well, you'll be even better the next morning? And I said, oh. He presented scientific research on that very fact. Others believe even just posing a question, take a question in mathematics if you want to be serious, posing that question, it is often resolved in sleep or it will be resolved in your next day's work. Something's going on. And I guess my fundamental premise, uh, Joanne knows better than anyone the history of unity of Chautauqua. And I wonder how many times we've said the prayer for protection with that line, wherever we are, God is. 
to me, that's one of our most fundamental teachings. And if you take it logically to its extreme, God is in our dreams, in our sleep, not just during our activity in the day, when we encounter other people, when we do our work, when we take care of our family or our friends. That truth tells us that spirit is active in our sleeping process. Do you think God would have designed human beings to have this rhythmic process of wakeful day consciousness, nighttime, sleeping, dreaming consciousness? Do you think we would have been created that way if sleep was just a time that we flipped our off switch and just our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our spirits did nothing? for six, seven, eight hours, and then we flip, turn ourselves back on. Oh, something must be going on. Since I am pushing his book, The Oracle of the Night, in your Chautauqua bookstore, but of course available online, and, and uh, Barbara's already got a Kindle version of it, because this is kind of a heavy book and a little more expensive than, than most. I paid $35 for this at the Chautauqua bookstore. But listen to his introduction. This just really resonates with me. During our waking hours, whether day or night, but with our eyes wide open, we experience a succession of images, sounds, tastes, smells, and touches. When awake, we live mostly looking outward. Since our actions and perceptions are connected to the world that is beyond our inner world. And then, more or less often, whether night or day, but with our eyes firmly shut, we enter that state of unconsciousness in which the screen of reality is switched off. From this sleep, which is so familiar and restorative, we remember little, which is why it is common to think of it as an absence of thoughts. Sleep is often considered a sort of non-living, small, everyday death. But this is not true. What do they mean, the elements and plots of these dreams that are so clear and so filled with emotion? Do they actually mean anything at all? Is there some logic behind the dream? Is the dream an inexplicable fact of human existence or an unfathomable arcane mystery? Is dreaming chance or necessity? Dreaming chance or necessity? And on that point, he quoted research, this is just kind of a minute detail, but those of you that know me know I love minutia and little details. But they've done research where in a certain way, I won't go into all the science, but we know that dreaming is most active during rapid eye movement or REM sleep. And so they can study the cycles that a person is in and then disturb them, deprive them of that REM sleep, which is a dreaming process. And they will have everything from confusion to physical health issues in their waking hours by depriving them of that necessary process of dreaming. Others also believe that it is in the dreaming process that our soul slash spirit, we won't separate, separate them right now, but where they work through our memories of our activities of the day in such a way as to move them from short-term to long-term memory, thereby making them more permanent. And that's not just this author. I've read many 
who've studied sleep and how important that process is while we're asleep to take our experiences of the day and give them permanency by place by moving them into our long-term memory so they become a lasting treasure for us. Charles Fillmore, <clears throat> excuse me. Charles Fillmore. Um, Do you like some water? I'm, I'm okay. okay. I something in my throat. Uh, <clears throat> Charles Fillmore had a wonderful statement that reflected what I was just reading about this alternating aspect of our awareness, wakefulness, and sleep. And of course, Charles not only paid great attention to his dreams, he claimed some significant decisions about the development of unity, and especially how unity faced and weathered the Great Depression came to him in prophetic dreams. So he valued it. But first of all, he said something that I have the pleasure, applicants may not think that, but for years I've been on the credentialing team of Unity and part of our, our work is to interview ministerial applicants who want to become Unity ministers, want to begin training, we interview them, they do written tests and so forth, but one question always comes up and I'm always intrigued to see how they respond. And that is, what did Charles Fillmore mean by the soul is pivotal? The soul is pivotal. Actually, we know that that was even earlier in the writings of H. Emily Cady and Lessons in Truth, the same idea. But what Charles described is we can throw our attention into the outer world and gather up experience through our physical sight, our physical healing, smelling, taste, touch. We bring that in and it's transformed in our inner life, the depth of our soul, our heart, our mind. So he meant the soul, which he considered the working part of us, pivoted out to gather stimulus to experience from the outer world, then it pivoted in where we made meaning values. We saw the eternal aspects of who we were as God's creation. Myrtle once wrote, the world did not tell me these things of who I am. I only know that inwardly in my soul that I am a child of God. Famous words we hear. So isn't it wonderful? And it seems to me that that basic unity teaching that we're out here and we're in here, our inner life, which can include, of course, our sleeping and dreaming. I like to tell my congregation and students, your body is so wise, it will teach you. And if I were to throw my attention into the world like a great exhalation, start turning into you. The body tells me we go out into the world for activity and collecting information. You have to have an inner time. Whatever your spiritual practice is. And isn't it interesting that one of the words for this in breathing is inspiration? Inspiration. That inner work. So it seems to me that that basic teaching of Charles, of Myrtle, of H. M. and of Katie gives us an invitation, along with what I mentioned, 
wherever we are, God is, that there has to be value in this nighttime activity that we call sleep, and within that, dreaming. I gave you as an introduction, which I will not have time to do on your uh, handout, but to ask yourself, when we consider this rhythm in life, we breathe out, we breathe in, we're very active, and then we rest and we sleep. I think Sunday I said, we are young and youthful, and then we are mature. <laughs> so nice. that these seasons of life. My mother used to find it frustrating as she aged, but I want to remember things like I used to, fast, fast, fast. And I said, Mother, maybe that's not the pattern God designed. Just imagine your memories compared to mine are like a huge card catalog. Remember the old card catalogs yeah. in the library? You have so much to sort through. Perhaps you think more deeply than I do with my rapid fire facts and statistics. And I said, maybe that's a reason that some cultures value their mature members for the depth of their knowledge compared to the quick recitation of facts and figures. So on this first page, I just gave you an opportunity to look at some of these balances, work and play. Do you feel perfectly balanced in your life between the effort you're putting into work compared to what you put into relaxation or play? I don't think I am. I think I need more balance and play. That's why I cherish a week at Chautauqua. It takes me totally out of my routine. Your spiritual practice, whatever that is for you individually, and your religious Have you ever had a time in your life, I have, where my spiritual life is entirely based on a Sunday morning service, as opposed to developing my own spiritual practice where I do my own inner work, whether you call it prayer, meditation, yoga, there's so many, but it's a time when you're allowing an inner activity it's not based on your career. It's not based on making money. Finding a balance. So I won't take any more time, but I suggest you look at that, create your own polarities, and just consider, is this an area in my life where I need to balance a little bit more? I want to read um, Myrtle Fillmore after all of this letter she wrote more than a century ago to a unity seeker. Remember, almost all we have from Myrtle Fillmore are records of letters that she wrote to individuals seeking advice from unity. Uh, unlike Charles, who spoke to large audiences, those lectures were written down and became books. Myrtles always are one on one. She wrote to Barbara in Florida or Joanne. So here she's something she's writing, day and night experience, which gave me the idea for this class. I know some of you heard parts of this on Sunday, but bear with me. Day and night does not necessarily mean 24 hours of time. It has reference to the daytime of the soul when it has light and everything seems to be going smoothly and it can see evidence that the divine law is working in its activity. And to the nighttime of the soul, when a person has gone about as far as the light of his consciousness 
will take him in a given direction. And when he must turn within and wait for more light. You may not see how the law of the Lord is working for you, but it is working just as surely as the law of growth is operative during nighttime. Nighttime is necessary to the proper growth and development of plants, just as the daytime and sunlight with their warmth are necessary. We wouldn't say that business is dull with the plants during the night, or that they are not receiving their good in the nighttime. On the contrary, we have many times seen the transformation through the night, a plant that had seemed almost dead for lack of moisture and the ability to draw from the earth required elements will be crisp and strong and very desirable in the morning. So she presents this idea, this polarity of daytime activity and nighttime activity and how necessary it is, how we should respect it and consider it. Turn to the last page of your handout. Charles Fillmore wrote, a sure remedy before the beginning of the 20th century, and it stayed in Unity's publications almost up to the present time. You could still find it if you searched Unity archives online. But I won't go over it in detail. I hope you'll read it. But he believed there was a very important aspect to when we enter sleep that we be very clear about what we're taking into sleep and what we're not taking into sleep. And for him, he believed there was a sure remedy, a healing to almost any ill, as he would describe it, if before you retire, you forgive everyone in your life that you're holding a grudge, a fear, a prejudice. And what I like is he takes it even further. He said, any animal that causes you fear or repulsion, ask its forgiveness. It's part of God's creation. It's part of God's creation. Don't take that repulsion some creature into your sleep. It may show up in your dreams in a huge flock or herd because you are holding on to a strong emotion of fear about that animal or disgust. So isn't that interesting? Even, even forgive the neighbor's dog that causes you trouble and maybe you're afraid when you get near it and it's who would think of that? We think of Jesus' teachings, and of course we want to forgive our neighbors, our families, whatever. But Charles saying, take it as far as you can to release anything that you hold a negative energy toward. And he gives an actual uh, verse at the end of this. So it's one that is a nighttime practice you may want to try if you're not familiar and see if it makes any difference for you. You've got to give it a little time, a little practice, but you can remember what Charles Fillmore said early on to people that were listening to him or any of you in his programs. He said, take what you hear here at Unity, practice. Make an effort, not just once, but practice it. And if it does not bear fruit in your life, let it go without any sense of guilt. And I believe he meant by that, 
don't say, oh, well, this doesn't seem to be effective in my life, but I want to be a good unit student, so I'm going to keep doing this because that's what you're supposed to do. I said, no, if it's not working, great. Right. No, I don't feel guilty. Move on. Did you hear this morning's devotional service? And the rabbi was speaking, and he actually titled uh, his lesson, uh, Breaking Tablets. And he built it all up around the scripture. If you remember of Moses coming down from the mountain, and he saw the, the people worshiping an idol, the golden calf. And in disgust, he threw the tablets on the ground and shattered them. And later, God tells him, make two more tablets, and I will write my law upon them to replace the ones you broke, <laughs> was, was the scripture. And it seemed like a guilt trip to make Moses feel guilty for what he had done. But then the rabbi turned it around, also drawing from the Hebrew tradition that there are times when we need to break habits or the way we do things. And that comes to our habits. I don't know how rigid you are, like me, about preparing in the evening for bed and having routines. But some of these suge suggestions here, you might want to break some of your habits. I, I mentioned mine, watching television right up to bedtime when the lights are going to go out. I need to break that. I want to break that habit. To work more with preparing for sleep, honoring it. Some meditative verses I've worked with, and I'm just suggesting them um, to you appear as evening and morning prayers. These come from the 1930s from a minister named Adam Biddleston, um, who was involved in the Christian community, a movement for religious renewal. Just a brief remark, this developed in Europe in the 1920s when clergy, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, Reformed, others in Europe, came to Rudolf Steiner about 1922, and they respected him as a spiritual teacher, and they said, Dr. Steiner, our churches are virtually empty. We think this is new, what some of us are experiencing with our centers. As usual, Europe experienced this decades, if not a century, before our challenges, where their churches were empty. The cultural attitude became is religion relevant anymore? I guess it's fine for people that don't have any wisdom or education. The uneducated might need to faith or encouragement by the church, but for most of us, it's a waste of time. So these clergy came to Dr. Steiner and asked him, use your spiritual clairvoyance to give us some indication of how we can renew our various forms of religion, in that case, most of Christianity. And so he did. Well, that's just the background of Reverend Biddleston that wrote several of these verses I give you. And you can practice them. There are going to be some aspects of them that we're not familiar with when it speaks of angels or other spiritual beings. That was alluded to in the lecture. Charles Fillmore um, would often refer to activities that went on deep in our soul. And he didn't name them angels. Unity does not have a big tradition of angelology, the study of, of angels. But Charles did refer to thoughts, ideas, not opinions, not beliefs, not something we get from the media. The true creative thoughts were living realities. 
that did important work for them. To me, that's not unlike the older tradition of speaking of the angels, of a guardian angel that watches over us, works with us. Um, Professor Ribeiro was mentioning other research that was done. Did you know that going through the process of your day, you may think, oh gosh, my legs and arms have gotten, my back's gotten tired, all these things. But when we go through the process, process of the day, certain proteins build up in our brain. And it's only during sleep where there is a cleansing process of releasing those proteins, flushing them all away from the brain. And research has been done on the really negative health effects of slowing that process up. One way can be through sleep deprivation, where you're not getting the sleep you need. So here's a real hard material aspect going on in sleep. Charles Fillmore, I certainly know Rudolf Steiner and others would say, well, don't you think some kind of divine activity is monitoring and working that process of cleansing and sleep and of feeling? We know through research how the body is healed, mainly during sleep. And there's a lot of thought of why that is. Right now, just hold that idea that in sleep, the major activity of your healing is going on. Not only these brain chemicals that need to be washed away, but activities of building up what has been damaged during our daytime activity, and I'm not talking about damage from a fall or hurting yourself, but just the wearing down of your daily living needs to be restored at night. Some have suggested in um, the verses and the evening verse, it's on this page that says morning and evening verses. Um, and those of you watching online, you can contact uh, Barbara through the website, and she can send you these handouts if you'd like to have them. One of the most meaningful thoughts in this evening verse that sometimes I just meditate about, it's do you ever have a thought that's just like a jaw-dropping? I never thought, wow, that makes sense. That's powerful. It's this line that reads, my heart bears in it many thoughts of conflict, but also the thought of Christ. That is extremely powerful. When I reflect on my heart, and I know that I'm holding conflicting ideas. I'm holding outer conflict with another individual. It's good to see it balanced, but I also have the thought of Christ. This divine power, this Christ within that has restorative strength. And to just parallel, parallel those two ideas, if you've ever felt discouraged, as I have at times, well, are we going to pay all those bills coming into the church or in my personal life or in my community? These conflicting thoughts. And God has given this idea of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, his perfect idea of being. 
that indwells each one of us. And if we acknowledge that power, it aids us. Another in this evening verse, I hope you don't get sleepy as we practice these, but I, I found them very effective, this opening. I go into the realm of the invisible. Remember, I've closed my eyes, shutting off outer sensation. I go into the realm of the invisible, the weight of my earthly body, the surging forces of my earthly life release their hold. I have a friend that only meditates that at that time. Just that. The weight can be strained to my body. The surging forces, all that activity. Some have described it as the merry-go-round of life. All that hustle and bustle releases its hold as I enter sleep. I find it a very relaxing thought. Now it moves into this concept of the spiritual world or activities that aid us. In the world in which I now enter, the watchful care of angels, the loving guidance of archangels, the creative power of the spirits of the ages work on human souls. So it's introducing this idea that great divine work, God's love through many spiritual forces, beings. Charles in Unity spoke less about beings as he did about principles, but he believed in spiritual principles or forces at work in us. The line, my heart bears in it many con thoughts of conflict, but also the thought of Christ. May this grow in the world of sleep into full being that I receive through the powers of life is strength and peace. For me, this is a way that I can set an intention. As we learned in our lecture here at Chautauqua, in entering sleep, respecting it, and setting an intention for the healing work, the balancing work, resolution of so-called problems in my life. Some choose to pose a question as they're preparing for sleep, as they're lying in the bed. And then upon awakening, as our author suggested, don't jump out of bed hit the alarm clock, go start the coffee maker in two minutes. He said, allow, he suggested 15 minutes before you get out of the bed of relaxation. Rudolf Steiner said a century earlier, it is upon waking when you remain still that you will often hear a voice that is an answer to the question you posed as you enter the sleep. The morning verse. I come from the realm of the invisible and penetrate anew the stream of my earthly life, the house of my earthly body. I thank the world of spirit which has held my soul. I thank the world of earth which is guarded my body and sleep. May the light of Christ in the light of day shine for my soul upon paths of earth. This I find powerful. May the holy aims of God, which have warmed my soul in sleep, be remembered through the aid of Christ in waking deeds. It's a beautiful way of what we say in unity when we receive inner guidance from our spirit of truth, 
that we can remember that in our active deeds during the day. Charles said that we manifest in our outer activity these principles of truth. It's said here differently, but I believe that's the essence of it. We won't go over the detail on the next page, but this author has produced a whole book with verses like this, not only for evening and morning, but then for every day of the week, the months of the year, and the holidays, the holy days of the year. And on the front of the page, I mentioned the book and that it is available on Amazon if you would like more uh, in it. So those verses are beautiful as well. I wanted to turn to the next page, which is a verse from Rudolf Steiner. I discovered this and used this uh, as I took care of my mother in the last years of her life. And we would recite this every night before she entered that healing process of sleep. And it was given the title, The Holiness of Sleep. I like that, to have reference for the process of sleep. Holiness also implies purity of intent that we carry into sleep, as well as holiness can also mean a completeness in the process of our night's sleep. In this particular verse, Steiner uses the word Genius. Now let me say he wrote only in German. So this is a translation into English that uses the word genius. I've added a parenthetical remark, guardian angel. Your higher self. You can use different terms. I go to sleep till I awaken my soul will be in the spiritual world and there will meet the higher being who guides me through this earthly life. Him who is ever in the spiritual world, who hovers about my head, my soul will meet him, even the guiding genius, guardian angel of my life. Here's the important point. And when I waken again, this meeting will have been. I shall have felt the wafting of his wings, the wings of my genius will have touched my soul. Now this poetic imagery might not be exactly how you would put it, but the essence that verse carries is a respect for the holiness of sleep that there is a guiding power watching over, healing, helping you find solutions in your life. And when you awaken again, this is actually setting an intention. When I awaken again, I will have no, I will know, I will remember that a meeting in sleep has taken place that important work is being done in that as well. So, I have talked almost all our time away, but I wanted us to have an opportunity to share any insights, any inklings, any things that don't make sense or disturb us. We can put any card on the table because that's how we learn. Chautauqua, isn't it, with the dialogues? <laughs> yeah. We get it out there in a respectful um, way. So this process, as Rivero suggested, for entering sleep, one, prepare for it. I like to say, what do I want to take into sleep? My frustration and anger today A full stomach of a whole box of cookies, 
Is that what I want to take them to sleep? So that preparation for a holy experience of sleep. Then setting an intention. What is the intention? Perhaps I have a question I'm posing. Perhaps, as our author said in his lecture, you want to remember your dreams more. Some of us don't recall them upon awakening. They very quickly are gone. So he suggests, set the intention. I will remember my dream experience. And then finally, if you wake up in the night and you really want to practice this, any of you that practice journaling know that that can be very powerful. If you wake up or in the morning, jot down what you remember of that dream. He promises if you practice that, it won't be long before you're going to have a much richer dream experience that you remember. And the third point he made is the sharing of your dreams with someone you trust and someone who love and who loves you. Trust and the bond of love and share that. Maybe a unity prayer partner, whoever it is, but the actual act telling another what you remember of this dream. He said, if you do that, your dream life will remember more, it will be richer and more productive in the sense of helpful to you. So does it, do any of these ideas seem helpful? I think too, um, you listen to TV at night as you brought up, and it can even be our favorite news station. Mm -hmm. But it's still bringing in the fighting element. So we feel like this is good, but we're still going to sleep with that in our right. subconscious. And the other concept I would have this is that on Sundays I have learned I wake up early, seven in the morning, and listen to the morning tabernacle prayer. Man, I find it very peaceful. And then I Sundays have become a very, very wonderful time period. But I'm thinking something else, and that would be also that you might want to listen to that Mormon Tabernacle Choir in the evening before you go to sleep. And, or your Josh Grove in your favorite mm -hmm. prayer, whatever. That would change, just like we were brought up in the Catholic faith when we were little kids. You mm -hmm. would get on your knees and you say your prayers the day before you go to bed. But it's certainly a good concept that you brought up tonight. Yeah, it's important. You're right. And that preparation to sleep and, as these two verses suggested, the preparation of awakening, giving yourself time of stillness and peace. I think Riviero gave a good idea. Set a time. 50 minutes may seem long if you get up real fast, like I often do. I've got to get to daily word meditation, whatever. But set a time, maybe start with five minutes, that you just stay in bed and stay still and marvel. Just marvel at this process of your awareness shift from what you've experienced at night now becoming aware again of the outer world. And that marvelous phrase, may the holy aims of God, which are what? For your well-being, for your healing, for your development in every way, may they be remembered through the aid of Christ in waking who've been inwardly enhanced and healed by spirit, how may I take that into my activity of the day? James, do you 
Or have you worked with people who have trouble falling asleep? And would you just suggest we start with Charles Fillsmore's philosophy, or where do you start? Let's say you've taken care of the physical. Not too much TV, not too much mm -hmm. food, not too much. You just can't fall asleep. What well, there are going to be a lot of different reasons. My approach that I found helpful, and a friend of mine has found helpful when I shared this, is that um, I now enter the invisible. That second and third line about the weight of my earthly body, the surging forces, busy mind, yeah. and all of that of the day, release their hold. Start with that. Start with that. And I know it sounds simple, and but working with the idea that we've been designed in a way that if we will just acknowledge that entering sleep, we can release the sense of heaviness of our body, especially if it's tired, and releasing this busyness of the day and just practicing that. I think Charles' work precedes that. Uh, in the evening, maybe when you first get into bed, if you have the time to take it, do that sure remedy with the understanding of what am I taking into sleep. I had a bad argument today with Barbara. Do I want that, all those feelings? Do I really want to carry that? Because remember, the scientists say our experience in the day in sleep is going to be transformed into lasting memory for long-term So do I really want what I experienced in our little conflict? This is imaginary now. This little <laughs> conflict I've made up, do I really want to impress that on my soul in a lasting way? And I think that's a significant question because our intention in everything we do is fundamental important and, and creative in our, in our life. And that sleep process may harden, to use that word, or make more permanent things that if you think about it in your heart, you know, I, this is not the person or the life that I want to build. And that may come back to you in day experience. I catch myself a lot in lifetime or in day activity. Maybe a little gossiping or bickering, and then all of a sudden the thought, this isn't the kind of person I want to be. And at first, I may shame myself or whatever about that. But then I try to remember to thank Spirit. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. If this is not what I want in life. And give thanks because when we become aware of something, what? We can transform it. It's when it's sitting down there in the unknown of us that harm can be done. Just as this example of what we carry in to sleep. You won't carry, as our author said, your reasoning mind into sleep that you can think this out. Oh, I want this, I don't want this. Your body is going to work with what you take into that. So I hope that helps a little bit with the Certainly idea. Does. You know, he did he did talk, and I encourage you to go back and watch that lecture about uh, pharmaceutical aids to sleep and some other forms that he felt, just like in a lot of healing practices, start with ideas like this first, before going the route of surgery, and, yes, and all of that. And I know, it, I know it's not uh, easy. I have a joint pain, and it's very difficult if I don't take the Advil PM, I struggle with it, and it's kind of a crutch. 
that I'm working with right now, but sometimes we need that support. And so we can't just blanket say to everyone, I heard a wise person say one time, don't ever kick someone's crutches out from under them. It's not helpful, it's not kind, it's not your decision. And so he even said that today, I'm not telling you, don't take pharmaceutical sleep aids, but they do make a difference. And I'll conclude with one of my favorite sayings from Rudolf Steiner, I find it so helpful in my life, and that is everything in life has consequence. Choose what consequences you're willing to deal with. You know, and I'll just leave it at that. Kelly, Anna? I was just going to say, Kelly, that melatonin, is, do you ever take that? Oh, I take it. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I do. I've tried. Have you tried it? Many things. Yeah. And sometimes I've never gone in. I'm going to try these prayers. I think mm -hmm. that's the next step for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've tried melatonin, gummies, everything. <laughs> well, I actually mm -hmm. take it now because it also has benefits for like even your. Um, Breast health, yeah, melatonin. Yes. So I mean, it's not something that's going to. No, I take melatonin every right. night. Yeah. Well, I thank you all that joined us online and or are watching this class recorded later. And remember to contact. Give me the website name. UnityCHQ.org. Thank you, UnityCHQ.org. And you can make a request for the handouts, which include these prayers we've been discussing. I found them helpful. I hope they're helpful for you. So, good night, everybody.